Chapter five of your textbook is entitled Intersections. And as the title implies, this chapter is primarily gonna be about intersectionality and how our different social identities influence the ways in which we do gender, um, which the authors refer to as gender strategies. But before we get into um, those specific gender strategies, let's go over the question of the chapter. And that question is, if gender is just one part of who we are, why isn't it crowded out by all the other things about us that are meaningful and consequential? So in short, it's kind of like, if there are all these things that make up who we are, why does gender remain so relevant? Um, why isn't it subsumed by one of these other identities? So before we get to answering that question, let's just kind of go over some terminology, some of which is highlighted in your book and some of which I'm, I'm providing you now. So first of all, when we're talking about intersectionality, um, you know, the idea that we have these intersecting identities, um, that kind of structure, that position our place within the social structure um, that shape our identity, shapes, um, you know, what privileges are afforded us, um, shapes what uh, structural barriers are, are, are placed ahead of us, um, shapes how people perceive us. Um, and so, how your uh, authors refer to these different identities is they refer to them as social identities. And you maybe have seen this uh, before um, as being referred to as social statuses. Um, and it's pretty much the same definition, regardless of which one you use. And it's just the idea that these are uh, socially defined positions in society. Um, so, you know, that means that these are identities or statuses that are largely recognizable by other people you share a society with, right? So this isn't an identity or a status that you make up, um, you know, yourself, but it is uh, identity or status that is available to you or is assigned to you uh, by the society that you live in. And so all of us have multiple social identities and that is the, uh, and these multiple social identi identities, um, you know, we experience them concurrently. Um, so we don't go through our life, um, you know, just being our gender or just being our race or just being our sexual orientation. Um, but, you know, it is a kind of concurrent experience, a lived in identity um, that is rooted in all of these uh, individual identities. And so this concept of intersectionality, uh, you know, it comes from a, a, a a black female academic, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, and your book uh, relates this concept of intersectionality to an additional concept, um, which is the concept of privilege. And although there are a lot of different people with a lot of different definitions of privilege, the one that I like the most um, comes from Peggy McIntosh. And um, she's written about this from the perspective of white privilege, male privilege, heterosexual privilege. I give you a link um, to an excerpt of her list of privileges um, that she associates with white privilege. But here's this definition that she uses. You know, it's the idea that privilege is an invisible knapsack of unearned, unearned advantages um, that people can call upon when needed, when necessary. And I love that definition because there are just so many kind of important kind of uh, concepts embedded in there. You know, the idea that it's invisible. So oftentimes when you have privilege, you don't even realize you have it. The idea that it's a knapsack, right? So it's a collection, it's a constellation of things that you enjoy. Um, and then and like any knapsack, right? You know, what is the purpose of a knapsack? It carries things and you can go in it and get things as 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 you need them, you know, in essence, this is how she's saying privilege works, right? It's not necessarily, you know, that you call upon your privilege no, uh, consciously or even subconsciously, you know, all throughout your day, uh, every moment of the day, but it's the idea that those privileges are there waiting for you when you need them. And so the thing about intersectionality is um, when you think about it in conjunction to privilege is that because we all have different social identities, some of our identities imbue us with privilege and some of our identities um, are not privileged identities, aren't statuses in society that enjoy privilege. And so this, that concept, 
um, relates to the idea of matrix, do, uh, matrix of domination. Um, and that is uh, another uh, theorist, Patricia Hill Collins. Um, and I don't know why I misspelled that there, but I did. It's not Hill's <laughs> Collins, but Hill Collins. Um, and, and it's the idea that we all have this kind of personal matrix of identities in which we are either dominant or subordinate. Um, and so, you know, although we oftentimes talk about privilege, um, you know, as this straightforward thing, like, oh, yes, I uh, have gender privilege, or I have uh, sexual orientation privilege, or I have race privilege. You know, um, when you think of it from this matrix of domination type of standpoint, it's this idea that we all have this kind of unique, individuated matrix of ways in which we're oppressed and ways in which, um, you know, we are privileged. And, you know, we're living that, we're living that experience of, 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 of that mix of privileges and disadvantages daily. Um, and so just kind of keep that in mind, you know, even as we start talking about these gender strategies and we talk about them, you know, and, and, and how they intersect with these other identities, you know, we do it like, uh, you know, one at a time. How does gender intersect with class? How does it intersect with race? How does it intersect with sexuality, sexual orientation? But once again, how people live it is an amalgamation of all of these identities with all of their associated privileges and disadvantages. And so, you know, going back to that question, you know, if we have all these identities, why doesn't gender get crowded out? Um, and so your book notes, gender is not an isolated social fact it actually inflicts all of our other identities. Um, so, you know, our racial identity, our sexual orientation, our class identities, they are all gendered, um, you know, and the strategies um, that we employ, and I'll get to that definition there in a second, but the strategies that we employ, the which ones are available to us, which ones do people accept when we use them, which ones are we able to call upon most and least successfully, um, that is shaped by our other identities. And so this chapter is really about gender strategies, which is just a way of doing gender that works for us as unique individuals. And, you know, they start this chapter off by talking about some just general gender strategies. Your girly girl, your tomboy, your jock, your dork. I'm sure we can add to the list if we thought of some more. Um, but, you know, they're like this gender strategy kind of gives you like a broad framework for how to do gender in that type of way, in that fashion. Um, and then your textbook notes, we oftentimes then break the rules or cut a deal um, with these subcategories so that we can feel like we're being even more authentically ourselves. So, you know, um, I've always been a girly girl. However, um, I, I have a kind of uh, hard aggressive personality, um, even with all the, the pink that I wear um, and the skirts and the dresses. Um, that is how I cut my deal. Uh, that's how that gender strategy feels most um, normal to me. Um, you know, that I, even as, as early as 13, 14, you know, I might be dressed like a princess and cussed like a sailor and have spent most of my life, um, in the words of several ex-boyfriends, dating like a dude, right? So it's this idea that you decide upon a strategy that you like, um, and then you cut deals and, and you find a way to make it work for you personally. Now, part of, of, of how you make it work for you personally and part of how you decide which strategies um, to employ uh, is influenced by your other social identities. And that is what the remainder of this chapter is about. It's about how do our other personal characteristics and social identities, how do they shape our gender strategies? Um, so how I'm structuring this for this class is that in order to provide like some context for these social identities, I will be giving you some background sociological material for those of you that have taken a lot of sociology classes, um, or at the very least have taken an intro sociology class, um, that background material is gonna sound very familiar. Um, 
Um, but you know, this is really just uh, to serve as a crash course for people who maybe don't have that sociological background or as a reminder for those of you who have taken these classes, but it was a while ago. So we'll work our way through each social identity. I'll provide some sociological context and then we'll kind of quickly talk about, you know, what types of gender strategies um, your, your textbook um, discusses in regards to that social identity. So we're going to be beginning with socioeconomic status, but <clears throat> in order to discuss that, we're going to take a step back and talk about some other kind of concepts related to it first. So first of all, pretty much all known societies, including our own, are characterized by social inequality. We all don't have the same amount of the good stuff, and the good stuff being income, wealth, power, prestige, higher education. So there's a disparity. Some of us have a lot, some of us have a little, and some of us are in between. And we call that social inequality. Now, how you have, how society structures access to the good stuff, to those resources, um, we refer to that as social stratification. And this is the idea that there's a systematic ranking of different groups of people in a hierarchy of inequality. I always like to tell students, think about it as a ladder. So if the, the good stuff, the, the resources that we all want, if they're, you know, in a, in a tall tree, <clears throat> Um, society is structured in such a way that different groups of people are placed on the rungs of a ladder so that some people have better access to the good stuff than others. Um, and so to build on that ladder example, um, another set of terms that are really important when you're thinking about social stratification is whether or not the system is closed or open. If the system is closed, that means there's no mobility occurring. The rung you're born on is the rung you're pretty much going to stay on for the rest of your life. It's a closed system. There's no mobility. But if the system is open, um, then, you know, the rung you're born on does not have to be the rung that you remain on in your entire life. There are ways for you to get ahead um, to experience upward mobility. Although it's worth noting, in order for that to happen, um, some people do have to fall from their perch um, at the upper rungs of the ladder. They have to experience downward mobility, um, because if not, then the kind of general mobility of, this, of society is going to be pretty limited. Um, so the type of stratification system that we have, that, we, that, that most Western industrial societies have had for centuries now, is what we call a class um, system. And in the class system, um, you know, our rungs are referred to as social classes, groups of people that share um, a similar level of resources and thus share a similar lifestyle. Um, and, you know, the, although there are different characterizations um, of what this class system in the United States looks like, the one that I have always been most um, particular to is the six class system um, that you see depicted in that graphic, where the top class um, is referred to as the capitalist class, sometimes it's referred to as the upper class. Um, and, you know, this is the top uh, one to about 5%. Um, usually the key thing here is this is definitely where, um, you know, people who live off of their wealth more than their income, um, whether that's due to investments or inheritance, this is that class of people. Then you have the upper middle class. Um, these are the group of people, they make six figures or more, um, and they're our, uh, they're our, our professionals. Um, they did not just go to college, they went to um, some type of postgraduate, usually professional education, your doctors, your attorneys, your, you know, stockbrokers, um, uh, your pharmacist, right, uh, your dentist. Um, so that is that group. Lower middle in, in, in is kind of an, a, a mixed group because some people are in lower middle due to their income, um, meaning they make about a little bit over what is median income in America. So right around, you know, $60,000, um, um, 55 to 60,000. Um, sometimes they make that money because they have a college degree, um, but they perhaps do not have a college degree in a very well compensated field. And sometimes they make that money because they have a well compensated trade or, you know, they own a small business. Um, 
so th th that it, that that group can be the most diverse. Then you have the working class. Um, in this group, you very rarely have people um, that have anything beyond a high school education. Um, you know, they are working full time, um, but uh, you know, they make about thirty six thousand dollars a year. Um, so these are not very high paid positions. Um, then you have working poor. Um, so these are people who perhaps finished high school, perhaps dropped out. Um, the key thing here is, is they are making about full-time minimum wage in a state where the minimum wage isn't much higher than the federal minimum wage. So it's not like they're making living wage anywhere. So these are your like laborers, your low paid service workers, your low paid salespeople, your fast food workers, unless you know they're working at in and out where i i definitely have had my students in california check me on you know how much in and out workers uh, make um but we consider these people to be working poor um, and the kind of the, a really important distinction there is oftentimes when we talk about the poor we are talking about the people that I'm going to talk about next, the people that, you know, are we, are we would consider to be underclass. We talk about how the poor doesn't work. Or we talk about how the poor, you know, lives on government assistance. But it's worth noting that a large number of people in America work, um, but even with working, they have money that would constitute them being poor. They are right at the poverty line or perhaps right above it. Um, and, and especially if they're right above it, this can be uh, truly significant because it perhaps make them it perhaps makes them less eligible um, for any type of government assistance programs. So as I just referenced them, um, you know, we have the underclass. Uh, oftentimes, this is a group that we associate with um, not having a high school diploma, um, and they are either unemployed or only partially employed, seasonally employed. Maybe they live on some form of government assistance. Um, <clears throat> it's worth noting that sometimes, um, you know, someone looks like they're underclass because they aren't legally gainfully employed, um, meaning that they are uh engaging in some type of um you know labor that is occurring off the books um they would still appear to be part of the underclass um to the people who make these designations so that's what's um you know that that just kind of gives you a sense so when we're talking about socioeconomic status that's a fancy way of saying that we're interested in you know how much money you make but also um your level of education and also you know your the social status you know in a lot of states a job like a teacher you know, really makes closer to working class money than even lower middle class money. But because teachers, um, one, are educated, they, they have a college education, but two, they do a job that people hold on a lot of esteem, you know, we would never put them as part of the working class, even if their income makes it seem like that that's where they belong. So just know when we refer to SES, it is a mixture of both social factors as well as economic factors. So your book talks about a variety of, um, of of gender strategies that relate to socioeconomic status. A lot of them being statuses related to how people form families and how they kind of divvy up, um, you know, uh, economic as well as household uh, labor duties within their families. So they talk about the breadwinner, which traditionally has been a man. And, you know, especially in this day and age where very less jobs pay what's called a family wage, enough money to raise a family on, you know, so now if we're talking about a breadwinner, this is off, it, this is usually the type of man who makes enough money for his partner to stay comfortably at home um, and focus on the family, which, so for the women who are employing that gender strategy where they are not working um, and they're instead focused on uh, their home or volunteer activities. Um, we call that the family focused strategy. Um, and so, you know, I tried to pick uh, examples from, you know, TV to try to make this resonate a little bit more. Um, and so, you know, I have Betty and Don Draper from Mad Men. And it's worth noting that breadwinner family focused, um, that, that duo 
uh, was a lot more common, uh, you know, in the 50s and 60s and become, has become a lot less common, um, uh, you know, in the last couple of decades. Um, and so what has become more common, especially as more women are, are going to college, choosing occupations that they're passionate about, that they love, that they don't necessarily want to set aside, um, when they uh, perhaps marry and have children is the co-breadwinner. Um, and so, you know, if you now have families where both people have professions that, you know, are well compensated and they could afford for someone to stay home, but honestly, no one wants to. Um, and so that is a gender strategy um, that can be em employed, right? So and now instead of that breadwinner family focus, you might have um, two partners who are co-breadwinners. And then they talk about another, uh, sometimes a person works, um, but they're not working a job that really means a lot to them. It's not a profession, it's not a passion. Um, you know, perhaps their partner has the type of, of, of career that involves a lot of movement or their partner just has a, uh, the type of career that, you know, involves them having to like be supportive in, in various ways. And so they can't focus on their own career. Um, and we call that the supportive spouse strategy. Um, and, you know, once, you know, and, and just in terms of gender, um, the supportive spouse strategy is more likely to be hailed by a woman um, than by a man. Um, so, you know, oftentimes uh, you, they can't afford for um, the female partner to stay at home, so she can't be just family focused, um, but it's not like her career is supposed to be um, as central or as significant as her male partner. Um, and so it is the supportive spouse. Um, and then they talk about, okay, um, with uh, the co-breadwinners, there is this assumption that because they have all that additional money, uh, in a lot of ways that they can form, they can afford to kind of outsource uh, a lot of their household and maybe even child rearing duties. And in the breadwinner family focus uh, strategies, obviously the woman is doing the, most of the child rearing and the supportive spouse, um, uh, that type of uh, duo, um, you know, once again, the, the expectation is that the woman is doing a lot of the caregiving. But the super mom, super dad, um, this is the idea that the person is working a, a job um, that requires a lot of their attention, but then at the same time, they're putting a lot of effort um, at, home, at home into, you know, uh, housework, uh, child rearing. Um, certainly, if a person is a single parent, whether they're a single mom or a single father, um, then they inherently are super mom, super dad, because there isn't, there is not another adult for them to split these duties with, um, you know, that they are having to do it all. Um, and, 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 and that's important because how they evaluate themselves might be different than how a family focused woman might evaluate herself or co breadwinner um, woman might evaluate themselves. So, right, it's, it's an idea, and, and a lot of these strategies are, are about finding a way to feel good about how you are doing um, your gender, um, finding a way so that you feel like you are a winner and not a failure um, by focusing on what you can do versus is what you can't do. And so a good example of that um, are the stay at home dads, um, because, you know, they are, this is a gender strategy that although it's becoming increasingly um, more common, um, it, it is still, as your textbook notes, is still a strategy that is more likely to, to, to raise um, uh, uh, eyebrows, it's unexpected. Um, they note that it is much more acceptable to be the super dad, like to be super involved in, in especially in child rearing, um, but then still work some type of job, um, even if your wife is the breadwinner, um, versus to be the stay at home dad. The stay at home dad is a gender strategy that more directly confronts those hegemonic masculine ideals. Um, 
And so, you know, so like a lot of these uh, strategies related to socioeconomic class were about how do people set up and organize their families. Now, they did talk about a couple um, that were just strictly related to class, did not have to do with family structure. So they talked about how blue collar guys, because, you know, that type of work isn't as well compensated as white collar jobs, you know, they possibly, it possibly could make them feel badly, right, you know, that they're not like wealthy, you know, um, you know, man of the universe, um, you know, can afford to have a, a wife that stays at home. Um, but they said that, you know, the blue collar guy strategy emphasizes, you know, the aspects of masculinity that their line of work um, uh, allows them to, to evidence in ways that white collar jobs do not. So the fact that they're working with their hands, they're, they're, they're handy, they know how to fix things, they don't mind getting dirty, you know, if they're working construction or a job like that, you know, there's still there's this focus on toughness. And so once again, it allows them to feel good about doing masculinity in the way that they can do it. And it softens the blow in the ways that they can't necessarily uphold the hegemonic masculine ideal, like being um, well compensated or having a lot of power, um, you know, in their employment area. Um, you know, they also talk about how for, um, for some women, especially women who are working class, because their jobs are oftentimes dirtier um, than what is normally expected for a woman, you know, they might uh, embrace what they call the tough gal strategy, you know, that, you know, rejecting that kind of, um, you know, uh, femininity that says you have to be dainty and clean and, you know, don't want to break a nail. And instead they emphasize the ways in which, you know, that they're tough and they can keep up with the guys and they, you know, have a career um, or job that, you know, does that, that they're only one of a, a few women who have it, right? So once again, it gives them this pathway to say, I am a woman, but I am a woman in this type of way, um, as opposed to just saying, you know, I reject femininity uh, altogether. So the second social identity that your book tackles is race. And so, you know, as we, before we get into those gender strategies that they talk about uh, in regards to um, Blacks, Whites, and Asians, um, let's talk about race, uh, generally speaking. So, you know, we can look around, um, well, maybe not now, because we've all been quarantined and isolated for months, but, you know, you go out in public, you look around, you can see that human beings have physical differences. And, and this is, you know, in terms of their features, um, the shape, um, you know, of their eyes or lips or nose, their skin color, hair texture, height, eye color, so we look differently, um, and, and this is what we call phenotype, you know, what you look like. And there was this long assumption that because we look so different, we must be different on the genetic level, what's called genotype, what our genes are. And that, you know, because we have these different genes, you know, clearly we're different races. Um, you know, we're, we're all part of the human species, but, you know, we're subspecies, if you will. And that was an assumption for a, you know, a very long time. Um, and, and we, you know, and, and it was an assumption that had a lot of social weight. You know, we enslaved people over that assumption. Um, we made laws allowing, you know, people, you know, dictating, you know, where people could live and whether or not they could vote and whether they can remain in a country, whether or not they could own property, you know. Um, we, we being human society, um, particularly here in, in America, um, you know, we spent a lot of time invested in this idea that we are different, um, not just in terms of looks, but at the genetic level. But lo and behold, um, a couple of decades ago, as we developed the technology to break down the human genome, um, and that was called the Human Genome Project, what we discovered is that genetically, all human beings are nearly identical. Um, we share something like 99% of our DNA with other humans. You can't actually see racial difference at the genetic level, meaning if you're looking at genes, you aren't going to be able to figure out who is white, who is black, um, who is Pacific Islander, who is Native American, um, you know, who is Latino based on uh, you know, you looking at that person's um, genetic makeup. And so, you know, um, 
that means that, yeah, on a biological level, race isn't real, um, you know, but just because race isn't real, um, that doesn't mean the consequences of it hasn't been real. Um, because uh, according to the Thomas theorem, which is a pretty significant theorem, it pops up in several areas of sociology. If people define situations as real, they are real in their consequences. We have spent centuries defining race as real. Um, a lot of people avidly believing that race is real, believing that human beings are different, making laws based on this difference. So, you know, two decades of scientists trying to convince people, you know what, it's not real. Like we are, despite how different we look, we aren't really that different at the genetic level. You know, there are less differences in human beings at the genetic level than there are between fruit flies, um, you know, let alone different types of dogs, like fruit flies have more variation at the genetic level than human beings do. So the science is there, but human kind of perception, um, it's not there. Um, and so in this sense, you know, we talk about race being a social construct, but it's a social construct that has a lot of power, right? So, you know, we created it and we now know that we created it and there's very little biological basis for it. But, you know, after centuries of upholding this creation and this construction, it's not gonna go away anytime soon. And how people feel about it, um, you know, how people treat people, how people perceive people, um, you know, that is not going to change dramatically or extremely quickly um, just because we now know that biologically the basis of race is pretty much moot. So, you know, we, because we created this concept, um, you know, we have to be able to measure it. You know, we, it, in, in our society, we collect a lot of data um, based on uh, the concepts of race and ethnicity. Um, and so now let's briefly just kind of distinguish between those three terms that people toss around interchangeably, but sociologically, they're not interchangeable. They all have their very own uh, distinct definition. So race, um, this is the idea that a group of people share physical similarities. Um, they share physical traits. They share phenotype. They look alike. Um, so oftentimes when we think about what characteristics have been racialized, you know, the ones that have been used to base racial groupings on, the big three are um, obviously skin color is the most, is the biggest one, is the most obvious one. And then also uh, facial features, um, so shapes of eyes, it, eyes and noses and lips in particular. Um, and then the third one being like hair, hair texture. Um, so we think, okay, you're, you are a group of people because you all look alike. You are a race. You share physical characteristics. Ethnicity is the idea that a group of people have a relation to one another based on shared cultural characteristics. So it's like, okay, you are a group of people because you share a culture and particularly the cultural components that we have highlighted um, as being significant for um, ethnic formation have been uh, language, um, right? So you share a language um, really when we're talking about Hispanics and Latinos, that's, that's largely what we're saying there. Um, you share a religion. Uh, so uh, Jews, um, Muslims, um, uh, they share, uh, they are considered ethnic groups because they share the cultural component of religion. Um, and, and, and once again, it, and, 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 you know, oftentimes there is still this, this kind of distinction between groups that we're wanting to pull apart as minority groups. Um, because we we don't necessarily think of like Protestants as being an ethnic group, or we don't necessarily think about Presbyterians being a unique ethnic group. But we'll come back to that kind of concept of majority and minority groups here in a second. Um, the third kind of cultural component that we in America we have lifted up as being um, a possibility that people can base an ethnicity around has been like nation of origin. And that brings me to nationality because nation of origin and nationality aren't quite the same thing. So your nation of origin is the idea, okay, if you trace your lineage back, where do you land? So when we talk about Italian Americans or Irish Americans, we usually aren't talking about 
first generation immigrants from Ireland or Italy, we're talking about people that can trace their ancestry, their heritage back to those places. And so we say that they are an ethnic group in the sense what, what they share is this tie uh, to the old country. Now, nationality is the nation that you are from, the nation that you were born in. Um, and so it's worth noting that, you know, sometimes people ask about people's nationality, um, you know, when they're really wanting to ask about their ancestry or their lineage. Um, but, you know, that use of nationality is not correct. Now, unless you're talking to a person that you know for a fact to be an immigrant, um, most people, if you're asking their nationality, um, the correct answer, if they they were born here in America is that it's American. Um, you know, if what you're wanting to know is, you know, two, three generations ago, you know, did they originate out of uh, Italy? Or did they originate out of Syria? Did they originate out of Ecuador, right? Um, you know, then you wouldn't ask that question in that way. So when we're talking about um, groups of people in America, um, oftentimes we will combine these two terms, race and ethnicity, and we'll refer to a group as being a racial ethnic group, which is just kind of uh, code for, you know, your group of people who kind of look alike and you share some type of cultural component, um, even if it's just kind of a distant home country generations ago. And so in America, um, we have what's called the five group racial ethnic configuration. That's the one that we most, uh, we use most often where we split our population into five groups. And those groups are white, non-Hispanic. Um, sometimes you uh, might even see them as uh, whites of European descent um, is, is, is a way that you uh, perhaps have seen this. Um, in the past, um, Caucasian was a much more uh, popular term, it's largely fallen out of favor now. Um, the second group is Blacks or African Americans. Um, then you have Hispanic or Latinos. Um, those aren't perfectly interchangeable. Um, there are, uh, although they have a lot of countries in common, um, you know, it's depending on who you're referring to, or especially if you're wanting to refer to the entire group, it is just safest to combine the two um, so that you're capturing, um, you know, Latinos are, are, they reflect, of course, um, you know, people who are from uh, the areas that, you know, we would consider to be Latin countries. Um, so it is like a, like a geographical designation, um, while Hispanic refers to places um, that speak Spanish. Um, uh, so that is a linguistic um, de designation. Um, so, yeah, um, so just to say that, you know, I, I go back and forth between my use of the terms. And for a lot of, of countries, they are both Hispanic as well as Latin, but there are a couple of countries, um, you know, that um, aren't Latin or aren't Hispanic, uh, particularly for the uh, non-Hispanic Latinos, uh, the countries where, you know, they speak Portuguese, for instance. Um, but anyway, um, that was a long aside. Uh, the fourth group uh, is another kind of umbrella group. Um, we're combining Asians, Native Hawaiians, as well as other Pacific Islanders. And then the fifth group are, you know, Amer American Indians, Alaska Natives, Native Americans. Um, a more popular recent term has been uh, First People. Um, so, uh, that is what we have there. Now you see in parentheses there um, uh, some percentages. So that was the racial ethnic makeup of America in the 2010 census. Um, we collect this information about our entire population every 10 years. You know, hopefully all of you have taken your uh, most recent census um, and that data has not uh, at this point come out yet. Um, so obviously this data is already just like, you know, it's dated, um, but it's the best that we have until the 2020 data is released. Um, but, you know, at 2010, whites, uh, non-Hispanic whites were 65% of the population. Um, Blacks were 13%, Hispanic Latinos were 16%. 
Asian, Native Hawaiians, other Pacific Islanders were 5%, and American Indians, Native Americans, Alaskan Natives were 1%. And those questions um, from the 2010 census, we got that data um, from the questions that looked like what you see there. Um, you know, first we asked about Spanish, Hispanic, Latino ethnicity, because we measure um, Hispanic, Latino as an ethnic group. Um, then we asked about people's race. Um, and so the racial groups were white, black, um, American Indian, Alaska Native, when we encourage people to write their uh, principal tribe. Then we give several options for our Asian Pacific Islander category. Um, and then we have some other race. Um, and so this is why we will, um, you know, talk about uh, uh, whites and blacks in particular as being like non-Hispanic white or black, uh, black Latino, um, because we're combining the data from those two questions. Um, and this also means, of course, for people who uh, consider themselves Hispanic or Latino, uh, in America, at least, we are currently not measuring that as a race. So they are, in fact, expected to go and mark themselves as being um, a race. Um, I know because I once did work with the 2010 census data, a very large number of them would go to question eight and then rewrite the same information from question seven <laughs> um, under some other race, basically stating that they were Mexican or they were Cuban or they were Honduran. Um, this was not what the people who created the census planned. Um, uh, so it's worth noting that that is kind of a data fail. So we are a racially diverse country. That does not mean, of course, that we are a racially equitable country. Um, some of that, of course, uh, has to do with our longstanding uh, racialized policies that made it harder for um, some racial ethnic groups to get an education, um, to uh, buy property, to open businesses, to experience upward mobility. Um, and so in our country, um, you know, we do have an issue with racial uh, inequality. And so out of that comes the term majority and minority groups. Um, and so the majority group, and this is always something that trips students up because the word majority sounds like it has to be the numerical majority. Um, and in the case of the United States, where whites are our majority group, um, you know, they are our numerical majority as well, and they will likely continue to be our numerical majority um, for at least the next 30, 40 years. Um, but it's worth noting that the majority group does not have to be the numerical majority. It just means that this is the group that has more than their proportionate share of social resources. Um, and so another term and, and that you can use if that whole majority group thing is confusing for you is the term dominant group. Now, I don't like to use the term dominant group because when you talk about a dominant group, that means you have to refer to the other groups as subordinate groups. And I just, I just, that terminology just doesn't sit right with me. I prefer to talk about groups in terms of majority or minority. But certainly if you're the type of student who really just can't get it out of your head that the majority group is not necessarily the numerical majority. Um, you know, think about, for instance, South Africa during apartheid. Um, you know, uh, white Afrikaners were not the numerical majority, but they were very much the majority group because they were the group that, um, you know, had the higher education, that owned the property, that opened the businesses, that held all of the political positions. Um, the fact that they were numerically small meant very little because they were powerful in resources. Um, and so it's worth noting that even if non-Hispanic whites stop being the numerical majority um, in the upcoming decades, um, unless there are some pretty significant shifts in terms of uh, political positions, um, property ownership, business ownership, um, it, it's unlikely that just just because they stop being the numerical majority that they're not going to still be the majority group um, if they still have those that disproportionate share of the social resources and by social resources you know once again i'm referring to the good stuff political power wealth uh, employment education privilege um, so that's what's meant by majority group um, and so the groups that aren't majority groups are pretty much minority groups and they are groups that um, are disadvantaged in regards to those um, social resources. 
but going beyond their disadvantages in, in resources, um, minority groups are also more likely to experience um, racism. Um, and so for this class, um, although this is a contested concept or more particularly, it's a, a contested definition. Um, the definition that I like is, it's the belief that one racial group is inferior to another, a belief that is further upheld by the practices of the dominant group to maintain the inferior position of the dominated group. Some people want racism to be all about, oh, you hate people of another race. Um, but at that point, racism then doesn't sound very different than just what it means to be prejudiced, right? Where you um, are prejudging, you have a negative opinion, attitude, belief about people based on a characteristic like race. Um, based on their group membership um, in, 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 in one of those social identities. If you limit racism to how people feel or what people think, in that sense, it's no different than a term that we already have, which is prejudice. Um, but people get upset with that uh, definition of racism because they get hung up on this idea that only the majority group can be racist. Um, and and to that I say, oh well, um, you know, because it isn't about what people feel. There are plenty of people who can dislike me. But if your dislike is backed by a system that prioritizes you over me, that believes that your life has more value than mine, um, that takes your word more readily than they'll take mine, that is what gives your dislike power. Um, because people of all races can be prejudiced, but people of all races don't have the power to really ruin someone's life or perhaps even take someone's life on the basis of that dislike. And so in this way, I, I think a, a good way to kind of think about, you know, racism, it's prejudice plus discrimination plus power, right? You know, it's that negative thinking, um, negative sentiment towards a group of people combined with not treating them um, equally or treating them unfavorably, but then also having societal power, which largely allows you to do this with very minimal consequence and perhaps a society that even supports you in doing this. Um, so, Keeping all those things in mind, you know, the sense that, you know, race is, is largely not based in biology, but it's a very powerful social construct um, that we have given, we, we have empowered in this country for centuries. It's resulted in different groups um, having uh, different amounts of social resources. It's resulted in different groups being more likely to experience racism. Um, and, and those components associated with it, prejudice and discrimination. Um, then what your textbook then says about the gender strategies related to race, hopefully will make a lot more sense. Um, so we begin with African Americans um, and they talk about how, um, you know, and they start with African American men and they say there's been a history of changing stereotypes um, because they've used stereotypes about black men to justify everything from them being slaves um, to them being seen as, as, as threats, um, especially to white women and white women's virtue, um, you know, during uh, the Jim Crow era where we saw this huge spike in lynchings. Um, you know, it's been used to justify uh, their limits being placed on their ability to hold certain jobs, um, to live in certain neighborhoods, to do certain types of work. Um, and to even in contemporary uh, society, you know, this idea of being dangerous and being violent um, and violence prone being, you know, those justifications um, for everything for, you know, uh, your textbook mentions how we perceive um, young black men in school to how black men are perceived and treated by the police. Um, so specifically thinking about it in terms of gender terms we've already discussed, black men are stereotyped or more likely to be stereotyped as hypermasculine. Gender strategy that they refer to as dangerous black man. Um, and I give you a reading about that um, if you want to explore that a little more um, there, 
the, that author titles it thug masculinity, right? So we talked about hypermasculinity when we um, were in the masculinity chapter. Um, but for African American men, hypermasculinity can be uh, very dangerous um, with a lot less upside um, than even what you see when hypermasculinity is put into practice by white men um, because of those kind of uh, cultural stereotypes around who's threatening, who's dangerous, who should I fear. Um, so the idea that they're stronger, they're more aggressive, they're more violent. Um, and, and even when this is, is taking place in, in arenas like sports, right? Um, they're a more athletic player, uh, they're stronger, um, you know, they're beast, um, you know, those stereotypes have real uh, societal repercussions. Um, and your book talks about that, particularly in regards to the relationship between um, this idea of Black men and racial profiling um, and police brutality. So one survival strategy is the enactment of docility, right? Of, of emphasizing that you're docile, that you're friendly, um, that you're not a danger, that you're not a threat. They give the example of the guy that whistles Vivaldi um, when he's walking by himself at night um, so that largely uh, white people are not frightened by him um, because the idea would be like, oh, a thug would never know, you know, opera. Um, and so they refer to this as the gentle black man strategy. Um, so basically, um, in order to to be safe, um, you know, black men who do hegemonic masculinity and certainly black men who do hyper masculinity do so at their own risk. So they have to almost feminize um, certain aspects of themselves, um, you know, in order to be more culturally safe and appealing. Um, and so that's their strategy. That that is a strategy. Um, for African American women, similar to black men, there's a lot of historical motivations at play. Um, you know, um, unlike white women who are considered to be dainty and to be vulnerable and to be pure, um, during slavery and the time period afterwards, black women were characterized as being the opposite. Um, you know, being tough, um, uh, being uh, sexually uh, permissive and, and promiscuous, um, you know, uh, being able to, uh, you know, work like a man. And of course, you know, all of these justifications were, you know, what allowed people to not feel like they were uh, attacking Black women's femininity, their womanness um, by enslaving them, by having them do hard labor, hard manual labor, um, by sexually harassing and assaulting and raping them uh, for centuries. Um, and so in, in the same way that um, Black men are stereotyped as hypermasculine, um, African American women are also um, masculinized. Um, they're associated with hypersexuality and physical toughness, traits that we oftentimes associate with men. And I think your book puts it uh, in a great way when they say a Black woman's race interferes with people's perception of her as feminine. Um, and, and, you know, they talk about, okay, how can uh, African American women push back against this? Well, they say that, you know, the girly girl strategy can sometimes be harder for black women to adopt um, when compared to the tough gal, um, you know, and, and they say, you know, phenotype does come into play here, um, that the more African a woman looks, um, the further she gets away from that kind of normative white woman model of femininity, you know, the long hair, um, the small bill, the small body, um, you know, the thin lips, um, then the harder it might would be for her to employ the girly girl strategy, certainly without maybe turning to um, resources like really expensive weave, um, you know, plastic surgery, uh, you know, contouring lips and, and that type of thing, contouring noses. Um, so it might would be easier for them to just adopt, you know, the tough gal strategy 
And that tough cow strategy, especially for black women, um, really taps into some stereotypes, um, you know, that have differing levels of, of, of kind of embedded insults contained within them. You know, strong black woman versus angry black woman. Um, and, and then your book talks, you know, like single moms of other races, particularly white women who can call upon the super mom um uh strategy you know black women even when their social class is is not uh, uh poor um are more likely to find themselves stereotyped as welfare queens um a stereotype that uh is is not applied nearly as much to any other group of people um a stereotype which I would like to say flies in the face of the data that we often have about who is committing welfare fraud and some of our largest welfare fraud cases. Um, and so all of this just means that, you know, how Black women navigate their gendered strategies, you know, is a lot more difficult. Um, and so they talk about one kind of positive alternative um, that Black women have embraced um, uh, when the girly girl strategy is, is not available or is not a good fit for them is the Black is beautiful. And this is that idea of of kind of renegotiating what is considered feminine within the race. So it does not have to be things like, you know, sleek, straight hair or things like, you know, uh, you know, thin nose or thin lips. Um, and I have a picture there of Issa Rae because, you know, her very popular TV show, Insecure, um, if you've ever watched it, you know, she rocks natural hair in a variety of ways. And this this idea that this other type of beauty is beautiful too, that black beauty is beautiful as well. And you can be beautiful and you can be feminine um, without caving into that, to those uh, beauty norms that seem a lot more aligned with a white definition of beauty. Now, if African Americans, both men and women, are uh, overly masculinized, then when talking about Asian Americans, um, they are, are both over feminized. So for Asian American men, they are oftentimes perceived as deficiently masculine, um, is the, the way that your book describes it. And so, you know, why is that? You know, part of it, of course, has to do with um, some differences in like size, height. Asian American men are uh, assumed to be smaller, lighter, less muscular than whites. Um, uh, especially because in our country, the large number of first generation um, Asian Americans that come on the basis of like work and school visas, you know, so they are stereotyped as being uh, nerdier, more serious, more studious, uh, dorkier um, than what the hegemonic male would be. Um, this uh, perception is also rooted in history. You know, your book talked about how um, when uh, particularly the Chinese came to uh, work on the railroads and to participate in the gold rush uh, in California and other Western areas, and then they suffered, um, you know, from racism and the country uh, decided to pass the Chinese Exclusion Act, which prohibited um, Chinese from, from, from immigrating into America after that, including um, female, um, females. Um, so basically they created like a whole generation of Chinese, of Chinese men who were forced into bachelorhood. Um, and so it kind of um, demasculinized them. Um, they weren't uh, kind of afforded, they weren't afforded this ability, um, you know, to do heterosexuality um, because they were kind of cut off from suitable mates because of course they also passed laws um, that made uh, racial intermar intermarriage um, with, with Chinese men um, uh, uh, illegal uh, in a lot of those Western states. So, you know, there's that historical component. Um, and so they have these racial stereotypes, um, similar to, to Black women, that interfere with their ability to conform to gender expectations. Um, because, you know, you think about that hegemonic male um, ideal, 
there are all these stereotypes of Asian men that pretty much position them as, as being the opposite of that. So the strategy that they say um, some Asian American men um, then engage in is what they call the assertive Asian strategy. Um, you know, being outgoing, being gregarious, being assertive, being almost aggressive, being pushy. Um, and, you know, kind of, um, you know, doing hegemonic masculinity um, to the point of almost being hypermasculine, um, but it's never quite perceived as being hypermasculine because their Asian identity um, um, kind of strips some of the, 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 the masculine, uh, masculineness of their gender expression away. Um, I give an example from 13 Reasons Why, um, you know, the fact that they had this Asian character, um, but his Asianness was not really a, a crucial part of his identity um, of how he was presented. He was presented um, as largely being in a lot of ways, um, like all the other uh, football players, baseball players, um, jocks um, that he surrounded himself with, although uh, the other guys were all white or black, um, but he his his character uh, was very similar in 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 terms of personality. Then Asian American women, um, they are also um, feminized, and and your book talks about this as hyper feminization, um, what they call the Oriental flower strategy. So for Asian American women, you know, they are seen as being, um, you know, uh, submissive, passive, demure, sexually available. Um, and your book notes that, you know, once again, a lot of this is based in, in history. Um, it has a lot to do with, uh, you know, uh, the popularity of of Asian prostitution, uh, more like sex slavery that existed in uh, Chinatown and, and, and went unchecked for a very long period of time. Um, you know, the comfort women um, that American soldiers um, interacted with um, without really thinking about, you know, um, kind of the kind of practical realities behind those women's lives. Um, the uh, kind of the fantasy of the, you know, Japanese, uh, you know, geishas and, 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 and all of that just kind of contributing to this idea of them being hyper feminine, um, going beyond even emphasized femininity, especially in contemporary society where less women are doing emphasized femininity. Um, Asian women are stereotyped as being hyper feminine. Um, and this certainly plays into um, kind of uh, their appeal um, in the dating market, particularly to people who are not um, Asian themselves. Um, and I give you a video if you are interested uh, more in that dynamic. So their strategy, um, they also can, can do the assertive Asian strategy um, that requires them to be, you know, more aggressive and pushy and, 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 and dominant. Um, but your book does note it's more difficult for them to employ um, because it's less culturally recognizable when they do that. Um, you know, when Asian American men do that, it, it is much more recognizable like, oh, he is enacting the hegemonic uh, male ideal. But when an Asian American woman does that, um, you know, because we don't expect women to, to be that assertive, if they're being overly assertive, it can be hard it can be hard for for uh, people to kind of then kind of characterize and respond, um, you know, to what they're doing. Um, I, I give the example of Ali Wong, who I think is hilarious, but I certainly, you know, read reviews um, of her of her work and, and some people were very turned off by, you know, how graphic she was, how graphically she spoke about bodily functions and particularly men and sex. Um, and, you know, when I, when I read those reviews, I, you know, I remembered thinking like there are white and black uh, female comedians who are just as graphic. Um, I think it really was because, you know, she is Asian and there was this sense that this is especially unexpected for her. Um, and people weren't sure how to respond.
which brings us to uh, white Americans. Um, your book notes that they are what's called racially unmarked. Um, so what does that mean? Um, in the same way that, you know, with gender, we talked about how, um, you know, men are gender um, invisible, right? That we assume that a lot of things, doctors, police officers, firefighters, we assume that they're men. And so we don't have to remark upon the maleness of those positions, right? The expectation is my doctor is a man, my, doc my police officer is a man. Um, but that when women do those things, right, you know, that their gender becomes very visible. And we therefore say, oh, that's a woman cop, or I have a female doctor. We, mark, we remark upon it. Um, in the same way, we have this assumption that when we say American or normal American or everyday American or average American, we are talking about a white uh, Christian middle-class uh, heterosexual individual um, and we don't have to remark upon those qualities because those are the qualities that we had expected. So because white Americans are racially uh, unmarked, they're considered to be normal and thus they're normally gendered. Um, you know, they're the, the gender expectations that we have been uh, comparing everyone, every other group to are the gender expectations that rise out of this group, this group's history, this group, the perceptions around this group, um, the kind of uh, desires and preferences that originate in this group. Um, and so this means that there are a range of gender strategies that they can adopt if they choose and have the resources because they aren't having to necessarily work extra hard to prove masculinity or femininity. So they have a little bit more freedom in, in, in doing gender in a variety of ways um, because their masculinity and femininity is less likely to be immediately questioned um, compared to like Asian American men or, you know, African American women. Um, now there is a, a, a risk here. Yeah, I mean, it's a stigma. It's a, it's, it's, it's a small stigma. And I'll say this, it's largely on a societal level, pretty insignificant. It certainly isn't the same level of significance as, you know, your, your, your race making you a target for police brutality. Um, but it's probably not significant on an individual level in terms of how people feel it when they're living their day-to-day -day lives. And that is the stigma of because you are racially unmarked and your gender strategy is, is largely considered to be the normative gender strategy, um, then you run the risk of being seen as regular, boring, or uninteresting. Um, and so there, the, it, it kind of becomes, I don't want to say an imperative, but if you want to push back against that uh, boring, uninteresting, regular kind of uh, stereotype, then you have to adopt a gender strategy that is meant to be a uh, different distinction, right? Because racially you aren't distinctive, you adopt this, the, these, this strategy to make yourself more distinctive, uh, scarier, uh, more unique um, in a group. And so those types of strategies, things like golf, uh, they mentioned tough gal or particularly tough gal in terms of being a wannabe. Um, you know, these types of strategies are set apart from the all-American guy, all-American girl, um, because that's kind of the normative strategy. The all-American guy is, is basically the hegemonic ideal. Um, and the all-American girl, although, you know, that has fluctuated a little bit um, as we've moved from the 50s and 60s, where there was this expectation of doing emphasized femininity, you know, to, you know, this decade where we do expect all-American girls, you know, to care about their appearance, but perhaps uh, to be athletic, um, to care about their appearance, but to be, in, uh, you know, headed to college and to be good students and, and want careers. Um, I think the key there that remains consistent is that expectation that they're going to care about their appearance. But if that's not the strategy, so that's a very easy, that is a very easy strategy for uh, white men and women, young men and women um, to, to uphold. Um, if they want to reject that strategy because they consider it to be boring, then there are these other possible, you know, strategies, uh, goffs and, and tough gals and for, you know, white guys, you know, you maybe could think about gangsters, right? There are other strategies you can probably think of and find evidence for beyond the ones that your book even discusses.
So then our next social identity is sexual orientation. Um, this is the component of sexual identity that classifies sexual partner preference. We traditionally have been using a threefold categorization, um, but like gender, this is really more of a continuum. Um, and, and certainly, uh, you know, the three category, threefold categorization of heterosexuals, homosexuals, and bisexuals, you know, that's just a very nifty, convenient way to characterize, um, you know, who people are attracted to, who people seek to be in relationships with. Um, your book introduces the term sexual minorities, and you can think of that as being kind of the umbrella term for homosexuals, who would include gay men and lesbians, bisexuals, but then we also have um, new terms, uh, pansexual, uh, you know, where your sexual uh, preference and interest kind of goes uh, beyond, uh, you know, labels related to uh, sex and gender identity. And then asexuals, um, people, um, you know, who do not experience um, sexual preference or uh, or, or, you know, do, do not uh, identify as being a, a person that has consistent uh, sexual preferences or not even maybe cons consistent in the sense of, you know, um, of, of e experiencing uh, sexuality uh, in that type of way. Um, gender and sex identity is not the same thing as sexual orientation. We will have a later chapter where we discuss sexual orientation in more detail. Um, but just know that you cannot tell someone's sexual orientation. Um, we oftentimes say that, you know, like, oh, my gaydar, oh, I knew that person was gay. But, you know, what we're really doing there is we're conflating gender, particularly gender expression, um, with someone's sexual orientation. And in a lot of cases, we're just as likely to be wrong as we are to be right. So why do we do that? Um, you know, part of the reason is, is in our society, a lot of people feel like they have to hide their sexual orientation. Um, and that's because, you know, to, to, if they're a sexual minority and they're out and they're open, depending on, uh, you know, the area of country that they're living in, you know, they can experience heterosexism, um, which is, of course, uh, when there is individual or institutional bias uh, against sexual minorities. Um, and, and, and the pressure on even having to come out is because we live in a society that is defined by what's called compulsory or compulsive heterosexuality. The assumption is people are heterosexual, that part of being a man and part of being a woman, we define it by you then being attracted, um, to the opposite sex, um, right? So we build it into our definitions of manness and womanness. We build heterosexuality into those definitions. And so that means that for people who are not heterosexual, um, there is this just overwhelming expectation that they that that they are, um, and so uh, because to come out as 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 being a sexual minority is a process, and like I said, it does have some uh, inherent dangers associated with it. Um, some people do not do not come out. Um, and they talk about, you know, uh, one related gender strategy is what they call the not too queer strategy. Um, and in which case, uh, you know, it's not so much that they're hiding their, their sexual orientation, um, but they aren't emphasizing it um, in, in, in a lot of ways or in a lot of spaces. Um, and your book mentions that, you know, that has a lot to do with the fact of, you know, them fearing uh, prejudice and bias and discrimination. And they would receive those things, uh, you know, in a society that is, you know, heteronormative, you know, a society that is designed um, around the idea that everyone is heterosexual. Um, but if they don't want to hide it, um, then there are other strategies um, that they can employ. Um, you know, they talk about the recognizably butch strategy, um, and, and they relate that uh, obviously particularly to women, um, you know, so that people by your gender expression um, can make that assumption, um, you know, can, uh, um, you know, you're encouraging them to make that assumption that thus perhaps giving them, giving you the opportunity to, you know, confirm it if asked. Um, 
as well as the the strategy of queer um you know just once again making it clear uh that you are a member of the lgbtq community uh or an ally in some shape form or fashion um and that relates to uh you know the concept that your book calls homo normativity um which is the practice of obeying most gender rules with the noted exception of the one that says uh we must be sexually you know interested in the opposite sex um so people who are embracing the recognizably butch and queer strategies are rejecting um, both heteronormativity as well as homonormativity while a person who is doing the not too queer strategy um you know it by you know the definition of their sexual orientation um, although they're rejecting heteronormativity in a lot of ways they're still upholding homonormativity um, because except for their sexual identity they are still embracing and upholding all those other gender norms now you know once again um, like all of these identities you aren't experiencing this in isolation so your book does have some discussion about you know how race can come into play here as well as um, how nationality can come into play uh, because of course all of these things for nationality of course you know is it's is built on a very specific kind of cultural context um, so people's ability to kind of understand that context is, is going to be based on their knowledge of the culture um, and then uh, just for race, you know, they, they mentioned the fact that people who are already a racial minority and, and, and face those challenges and risks, um, that if they also then choose the recognizably butch or queer strategy and therefore kind of publicly kind of out themselves as a sexual minority, they're kind of just, you know, um, adding to to their to their risk um their risk of being discriminated against their risk of facing prejudice um perhaps even their risk of you know being the victim of violence um and so it, it, all of that's just to say that you know it isn't just their own personal motivations that might lead them to accept or, or reject a gender strategy like recognizably butch or queer so then the next social identity and out of all of them i think you know this is important um you know it's important points to make um they don't really give you any new gender strategies in this section um but it's really just kind of pointing out how a person's immigrant status if they are a new immigrant if they're first generation american or or an immigrant here in america how this might relate to their gender strategies and and they note that you know in general immigrants just already confront a lot of challenges in their new country including xenophobia um, where people are fearful and 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 have unwarranted you know hatred towards immigrants um so they already face all these challenges so you know the expectation that they do gender the right way um in in their new country um when perhaps the gender norms here are different in pretty significant ways than what was done in their previous country um you know that is a real challenge and they highlight you know kind of two ways in which you can see these challenges pop up in immigrant individuals um, one of them uh the kind of examples dealt with reconfigured families that you know the the breadwinner and family focused and supportive spouse and super mom super dad you know you perhaps were were able to embody one strategy in your home country but now that you're here in america you know maybe your economic situation has changed um you know maybe the opportunities available especially particularly for women you know maybe that has shifted and changed and this might lead to um the adoption of a new strategy and, and they say that you know this is something that sometimes families embrace together and then sometimes it's an issue that can tear families apart if one partner you know liked the way that it used to be and another partner wants to adopt uh, a different strategy a different gender strategy now that they're in a new social context um, the kind of other way that they talk about gender strategies related to immigrant status um, dealt with reconfigured sexualities and so, you know, 
uh, what does it mean to be a sexual minority in this nation as opposed to your home country? So compared to some countries, um, particularly some African as well as some Latin and Asian countries, um, you know, um, sexual minorities do have greater behavioral freedom and legal protection in this country than they do in other countries. Um, and so that might lead people to adopt different gender strategies based on their sexual orientation than what was available to them um, in their home country. Um, but then also, of course, there are countries that have, uh, you know, uh, better attitudes, more tolerance, more legal protections than America. So people coming from those countries might have a different take on what gender strategies are necessary um, based on their um, sexual orientation status now that they're here in America. Um, in general, kind of the big takeaway, I think, of this section is just the fact that, you know, the fact that there is this flexibility and fluidity in gender strategies in the lives of immigrants just really emphasizes the importance of understanding that gender is based on social context. Doing, there are no hard and fast rules about gender. Um, this is what it means when we talk about it being socially constructed. Um, if you if you change uh, you know societies, then the constructions around masculinity and femininity are of course going to shift and change as well. Um, I give you this graph just to kind of uh, sh um, to support my point that uh, you know certainly um, under the the Clinton and Obama years um, and even in the George W. Bush years, but much less so under the Donald Trump presidency, uh, you know, a certain number of asylum spots were available to people who were sexual minorities and claimed, you know, persecution in their home country. Um, so, you know, th there has steadily been uh, a, a, a influx or maybe influx is too strong of a word, <laughs> maybe trickle. Um, but there's steadily been a, a, a subgroup of immigrants who come to America expressly because they are sexual minorities and face dangers at home. So this discussion about, you know, how, how do I, how do I do uh, femininity and masculinity in light of my status as being a gay man or lesbian or, um, or, you know, pansexual, um, you know, this has been a, a, a real, um, you know, uh, question, challenge um, that people in this country um, have faced. Then we have ability, um, you know, as, as kind of being, you know, the setting up this distinction between ability and disability. Um, and so they talk about, you know, the role of ableism, that we have a lot of negative stereotypes um, and, and, and bias, prejudice against people who have differently abled bodies, um, that people who are disabled are oftentimes, um, disadvantaged in a lot of social settings and they're disadvantaged when interacting with people um, you know on on in job interviews on the dating market just in general we call this ableism and particularly the question for in in this section is about is is really kind of focused on how can physical disabilities interfere with our ability to do gender and so for men um you know it's that idea that it is hard to live up to the idea of hegemonic masculinity um when you have a physical disability you know whether that's uh you know like a you know severe like paraplegic quadriplegic or even something um, even just less severe, just because we make those associations um, of manliness with strength and athletic ability um, and, and, and aggressiveness and, 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 and all these kind of things that kind of are rooted in the idea that you're gonna have a, a certain type of body that looks and works in a certain type of way. So men who have a physical disability are largely cut off from that. And so, you know, your book talks about like two strategies in particular that they can employ. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, one is the strategy of what they call emphatically hetero. Um, so they can kind of push back on being labeled as less than a man by, by making their heterosexuality um, very apparent and, and, and very central to their personality. You know, and they talk about, you know, the person, you know, uh, the guy that would hang all of the, uh, you know, semi-pornographic posters and the one guy who flirted um, and made, you know, chauvinistic comments to the female interviewer. Um, you know, they, they kind of assert themselves um, rather obnoxiously, let's be honest, in, 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 a, in the one way that they still have available to them, and that's by um, being dismissive of women, um, you know, treating women in this kind of sexist, chauvinistic way uh, by asserting their dominance in, in this fashion um, because of, of their physical limitations. Um, another way, and there isn't a particular gender strategy associated with this, but um, it's just the role of sports. Um, you know, murder ball, which is uh, basically, I think like wheelchair rugby, but it's extremely aggressive and extremely violent. Um, you know, it allows the men that play um, to kind of embody that aggressiveness and that violence um, that we associated with men in, 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 in male uh, full contact sports, of course, like um, rugby and football and, and, and wrestling and, and hockey even. Um, you know, this gives them that option. And so that is a way for them to uh, kind of support their masculinity. And then the final kind of strategy is what they call the able disabled by emphasizing that you still are able to enjoy a lot of independence, um, that, you know, you're able to still maybe, uh, you know, take care of yourself, make your own money, not rely on a caretaker. Because of course, being dependent, um, physically dependent, financially dependent, um, you know, those are qualities that go against that hegemonic male ideal. So that's for masculinity. For femininity, um, it's a lot of things wrapped up in issues surrounding attractiveness because it's the idea that a disabled body is an unattractive body. And if so much of femininity is being attractive to men, appealing to men, then that places these women, disabled women, in no, no woman's land. Um, you know, this idea of, you know, can you really be feminine? Can you be a woman um, if, if you are found to be unattractive? Um, and so how they respond to that, some of them um, just kind of embrace that, you know, they reject it and, and they embrace that rejection. Um, and they go on to say that they find it freeing. Um, but then uh, the kind of alternative response and opposite response is hyperconformity, doing girly girlness uh, to the extreme, uh, to the extent that you can do it, you know, full makeup, hair, uh, dressy, you know, dressiness, right? Um, you know, going all in on that emphasized femininity. Um, and I don't have it listed here, but another way to do emphasize femininity, of course, is instead of appearance, um, is of course you could do it in terms of caretaking and nurturing. And so they say, especially if it, it is a woman who is disabled, but she's married to a breadwinner husband um, who, you know, therefore her not being able to hold a, have a job because of her disability is, is less kind of economically uh, consequential, uh, then it allows her to super embrace the family focused strategy. And the family focused strategy with its uh, basis in being nurturing and doing the caretaking, it is, of course, inherently feminine. So, you know, that is another way to embrace femininity outside of looks. The final section, identity, deals with age, and then they also loop in attractiveness to this section. So, you know, before we start talking about attractiveness, let's just talk about age. What does it mean to be old? Um, you know, used to be a lot more straightforward, and now, of course, you have sayings like 30 is the new 40, and uh, or, or 40 is the new third. Hold on. Let me, I'm, am I saying this backwards? 30 is the new 20. 
Um, so therefore, 40 is the new 30. And, you know, you have people like J-Lo that look like in Halle Berry that look super amazing into their 50s and, and, and have bodies that, you know, we would associate with 20 year olds. So, you know, and, and in terms of like retiring, you know, you have people retiring later and later in life, usually out of economic necessity. So just know that like everything that the answer to that question what does it mean to be old i mean it is a it is a it is a social construct like yes age is real you're going to age but those designations of young middle age old those are constructs so society is going to define that differently um over time it's going to define the you know define it differently you know based on specific uh country Typically, you know, in our country, we've we've kind of talked generally about oldness starting around retirement age, which traditionally has been around early to mid 60s. So, you know, you could think about the older years being kind of broken into kind of two different time periods. There's the transitional older years that begin in the early to mid 60s as people, you know, retire or if not retire, begin to slow down their work commitments. At this age, people are less likely to have young dependent children. So they've kind of moved and shifted out of that part of their life. Um, and so they're in transition. And then we move into the later older years, which is age 75 on. And usually the assumption is by the time you reach, you know, your later older years, that you have kind of moved out of a lot of these like uh, social roles kind of related to employment. Um, of course, you know, uh, in our country, you know, we have so many older people in our politics, you know, um, and, and we, we are having increasingly, you know, greater numbers of older actors, um, and even parents have gotten older. So none of this is quite as straightforward as it used to be. And at least part of this has a lot to do with the fact that we're living to be older and older. Um, we have had an increase in what we call centenarians. And so centenarians are people who who live to be over the age of 100. And you can kind of see there that compared to the early 2000s, um, you know, going into 2020, we've, we've almost tripled the number of centenarians um, that we have in our society. I remember um, growing up in the 80s, you know, that uh, Bob Hope used to wish people who turned 100, he would like wish them, a, you know, happy birthday on his TV show because there were so few of them back then, he really could, um, you know, na name them, you know, rattle off their names. Um, and not only do we have a rise in, in centenarians, we have seen an increasing number of super centenarians, um, people who are 110 and older, and, you know, like 20, 30 years ago, that was unheard of. Now, there is a real gender gap um, as people, you know, reach these older years, certainly a gender gap um, in the later older years where, you know, it's nine women to every one man. Women uh, do live longer in this in this country. Um, and so, you know, maybe I think that's an important fact to consider as we now move into our discussion of age and attractiveness, because we have more and more people in our society living to be older. We have older people that are in important positions in politics as well as business. People aren't retiring as early as they used to. We don't have mandatory um, retirement in this country, um, so people can stay in the job, you know, they can stay, you know, as long as they like, um, you know, but what they do risk facing is, you know, ageism, um, which is an institutionalized preference for the young and the cultural association of aging with kind of decreased social value. And we see this in, in, in the job market. We also see this in the dating market. Um, now, how does all this relate to gender? That's because aging is gendered. 
most of our gender roles are age related. You know, at what age do we expect women to wear makeup? At what age do we expect women to wear high heels? And at what age do we expect them to stop? You know, at what age should women be trying to be sexy? And then at what age does it become desperate? And at what age does it become sad? You know, what, what age do we expect, you know, men to be players? And at what age does it, you know, once again, become kind of sad and desperate? You know, we have these, these age-related gender roles. Um, and so a way to think about it is our gender roles are age differentiated, and then our age roles are gender differentiated. So some of the same things that we expect from older women aren't necessarily the same things that we expect from older men. And some of the allowances that we make for young men are different than the allowances we make for young women. And so a good example of this is kind of like how we think about um, relationships between older individuals and younger individuals. When it's an older man and a younger woman, this is much more culturally acceptable um, and expected. We even have a nice little term for it. We call them May-December relationships. Um, and, you know, sometimes people may remark if it's a truly like outlandish age difference. Um, but usually people oftentimes don't, don't bat an eye. Um, it, you pro it probably would not be very very difficult for you to quickly Google or even just off the top of your head to generate a list of older movie stars who have male movie stars who have much younger female partners or even just thinking about it in terms of the media itself the number of movies and TV shows that partner older men with younger women but then when you think about the converse uh, older women and younger men as your book notes there becomes this hint of scorn and derision you know we have the term cougar um, we don't even have that type of you know a uh, similar term for men uh, you know there's this sense that, you know, older women that engage in this type of behavior are desperate or sad and delusional. Um, they talk about how uh, unlike when older men marry younger women um, internationally, you know, this is this isn't questioned, but when older women do it, there's this assumption that they're being used and that's sad. Um, and all of this relates to the fact that for women, there is this expectation as they age that they are no, they are not attractive attractive anymore, and therefore do not deserve to be visible in the larger social context. The grandma strategy, and women who do not embrace the grandma strategy are largely like painted as as being desperate and delusional. Um, we we don't think about this for men. As your book notes, especially for upper class men who are able to age gracefully, you know, we think about them as being the distinguished gentlemen. Um, and, and, you know, there's this class aspect to that. Um, and, and there's something similar for women there, the, they call them the grand, don, the grand uh, dames. Um, and, and, but, but for women, like I said, there, there, there is less, acceptance around the idea that an older woman can be attractive. So, you know, she could age gracefully. People might say she looks good for her age or she's taking care of herself, but there's still kind of this underlying assumption that she isn't going to be attractive, particularly to younger men. While distinguished gentlemen, that is not necessarily the younger, uh, that is not necessarily the underlying assumption. You know, think about how people, you know, described uh, men like Sean Connery or, uh, uh, or um, Paul Newman, uh, you know, men like that in, in to, the, to the later years of their life, uh, even uh, what um, Clint Eastwood, right? They still describe them in terms of their virility and attractiveness. And even women who it's largely assumed have, you know, have aged well, like Jane Fonda, people still don't talk about them as being attractive, particularly to younger men. As your book notes, a lot of this is mediated by social class because whether you're a man or a woman in order to age in that type of way where you know you've taken care of yourself it usually probably means that you didn't have the type of job that was hard on your body you know that you could afford uh, you know good food and exercise and skincare and maybe even plastic surgery later 
Um, and that, that relates to social class. Now they do say for working class men, um, yeah, they can't necessarily be distinguished gentlemen because maybe they had jobs and led lives that were much harder on their body, harder on their appearance, but they can be within their family, the patriarch, right? You know, wise old granddad, wise old papa, pap pap, whatever you wanna call him. Um, and that there is still kind of more power um, and social value in being the patriarch than there is to being the grandma, um, which are, you know, the working class, working poor women who don't have the social resources that allow them to be the grand dames, you know, to be able to kind of hold on um, to that, to, to, to those kind of beauty related expectations as they enter into their 60s and their 70s. And so, you know, we end this chapter with this final kind of quote, gender isn't crowded out by other characteristics because it doesn't compete with those things. It colludes with them. Gender intersects with our other socially salient identities, inflecting them with gendered meaning, and every social position allows for different combinations of distinctions that carry cost and rewards. As we carve our masculine or feminine identity, we develop strategies designed to manage all these expectations, constraints, and opportunities. So keeping that in mind, um, because I have shifted your uh, paper, um, your annotated bibliography assignment, um, I am going to give you the opportunity to do this extra credit. Um, and so it's worth up to five points. You're going to choose a gender strategy. Um, so a specific strategy, uh, whether it's assertive Asian or whether it is family focused or whether it's distinguished gentlemen, right? Whether it's able disabled, right? You're choosing one specific strategy. So not a social identity, a strategy itself. And you're creating a PowerPoint presentation. Th Fairly short, three to five slides, excluding your title slide and your reference slide. So that means that, you know, the minimum number of slides that I should get from any one is five, because that would be three slides of, of material and then a title and a reference. Um, but, you know, try to keep it, um, if you go over five, that's just not a big deal. Um, but, you know, no, no slides that rival mine in terms of length. Um, what you're going to want to do in those slides is you're going to want to analyze how a person uses the strategy in modern society. You're going to want to make sure that you detail what the strategy entails, what resources are needed, what might be motivating people to choose it, and how it is publicly perceived in terms of rewards as well as cost. Find a minimum of three additional resources, journal articles, magazines, newspaper, websites, to use in addition with the cited use of the textbook. And you're going to put those resources uh, on that reference slide. Um, you're going to use them on your other slides for, in terms of your, the material itself, but make sure that you list your resources on your reference slide. Make sure you provide at least two examples, a uh, celebrity, public figure, person from a news story, or a fictional character of your strategy. So you're offering me at least two examples of your strategy, and then you're providing some background information uh, analysis related to your strategy. It's due at the end of the module, so next, uh, so it's due on Sunday the 11th at 11.59 p.m., and it's going to be worth up to five points.